Luke 18. Luke 18, starting at verse number 35. It happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, it gave praise to the Lord. Father, bless this time. Speak to our hearts, we pray. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I think the, the, uh, the key to this whole thing, I believe, is in the preceding verse, verse number 34. Verse number 34 tells us that the disciples didn't have a cl- I'll paraphrase, <laughs> didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. In verse 31, Jesus is, is saying to them, we've got to go to Jerusalem. There, all the things that the prophets told about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. And then in verses 32 and 33 where he says uh, he'll be delivered to the Gentiles and mocked and insulted and sped upon. They'll scourge him and, and kill him. And on the third day he'll rise again. And verse 34, the disciples, the 12, knew nothing what he was talking about. The truth was hidden from their eyes. Remember, when the Holy Spirit came afterwards, they were enlightened. And they remembered, they put it all together once the Holy Spirit got involved with their lives. And I think that today we have, we have many, many that don't really understand what the truth is really all about. And I, I believe the story of, of Bartimaeus, you know the story of blind Bartimaeus, there, there was a real account, a real thing that happened, but there's tremendous spiritual application involved with the story of his healing. Because as he was healed of his physical eyes, in verse 43, he was healed of his spiritual blindness as well because he then became a follower of Jesus Christ. I can remember uh, back in the day, uh, as a new Christian, I had a secular job working, working somewhere in, uh, in Connecticut. And uh, this lady that I worked with knew that I was born again. And, and she really didn't understand why I had to be born again or why someone had to be born again. And she was a religious person. And I, I remember speaking with her, and I could still remember her face being somewhat perplexed at, at the things that I was saying. And I, I was being very gentle. I, I asked her if she knew what Good Friday was. And she said, yeah, I know. what Good, That's the day Jesus died. I said, did you ever wonder why it was called Good Friday? It wasn't very good for Jesus if he died. And why did he have to die? Because she was saying, all you really need to do is just be a good person. Just, you know, do the right things and you'll be okay. And I was saying, no, one has to be born again. And why did Jesus have to die if all we had to do was be good? And he died for our sins that we could be released from the bondage we're in. And, and I find the same scenario is true with many people today that I talk with. They may know things about the Bible. They may know things about the Lord and about church life and so forth, but they never really make the connection that Jesus had to come to die to pay a ransom for our lives so that we could be released from the grip of the enemy. And no one likes to talk about the enemy, but really that's what it is. He died that we could be released from the grip and the hold that the enemy had had upon us. And many people will say, what are you talking about? I live a good life. I'm not, I don't even drink. I don't even smoke. I live a good life. I'm a moral person. But there's still a grip of the enemy that will blind one to the reality of Christ. Their goodness, their success will blind them to the things of God. And so I, I find that Jesus, you know, he, he's, he has a mandate for the church, for you and I, to proclaim this message today. 
And I also believe strongly that the message, that this message must be, must begin in the church. Because here the disciples, the closest one to Jesus, didn't even understand. And I wonder how many people in our own church don't understand. And I could tell you stories over the years. I've been, I've been in the ministry a long time now. I could tell you stories of different people that, that I thought were so close to God, but yet they would do things that were really so, so outrageously wrong to do. And really, they didn't really have a heart for God when it came right down to it. So I, I believe strongly that, you know, Jesus said the wheat and the tares will grow together. And then there'll be a weeding out later. That's a picture of the church, which reminds me of another thing. And I'm totally off the notes, but that's all right. I knew God was doing something different today. Some people have asked me about, about our church and uh, our ministries and how, how, how we allow certain people to come. And I say, what? They need to come, you know. Everyone needs to come to church. Well, you don't know about this guy. I saw him. I said, I know all about that. Thank the Lord he's coming to church. Because you know what? Where's he going to get help? Where's he going to find truth? Where's he going to find hope if he doesn't come to a place where the word of God is proclaimed and worship goes up to the Lord? Where will people go if they can't find Christ in a church? So I, I think, you know, the church needs some attention with this. I'm going to skip all my preliminaries and get right to the four points. Is that okay? <laughs> the title of the message is, Are You a Bartimaeus? Are you a Bartimaeus? And if you are, it's good. We, we should be Bartimaeus-like. We should be like him. The first thing we see in verse number 35, Bartimaeus absolutely knew he had a problem. There's something about verse 35 that makes me sad. I see, I see the picture in my mind, a, a blind man sitting on the side of the road begging as the entourage is walking by. You ever go into, I was going to say our big cities, but not e even our smaller cities now, there will be people begging for money. You ever see that? You ever experience that? It's, there's a sadness involved with that. I've, I've experienced that myself. In fact, one time I remember I was in New York City uh, for the, uh, the grand opening of Times Square Church many years ago. And I'm, uh, on our way back to the car, this is a funny story, but on my way, our way back to the car, uh, a person bumped into me and, and started begging me for money, asking me for money. I had just purchased a huge chocolate chip cookie on the street, about that big. I said, man, I'm going to love that cookie on my way home. And I, and I didn't want to give the person money, so I gave him my cookie. Well, about two minutes later, I, I left him. I was going back to my car. He comes up to me again, angry at me because the chocolate chip cookie, he said, chipped his tooth. And he wanted to sue me for giving him a cookie that was chipped his tooth. But when you, when you get involved with situations, you know, well, that, that situation just dispersed quickly. And I don't know whatever happened to the dear man. But there are people begging, asking for help. There are situations out there. And so, so Bartimaeus knew he had a problem, and he knew who had the answer to the problem. Um, so let me ask you, do you know that you have a problem? I have a problem. I'm a Christian, and I still have a problem. The problem is the sin nature, the flesh nature that rears its ugly head at the most inopportune times when it's unwanted and unwarranted and mostly unnecessary, that old man raises his ugly head. Now, before salvation, it was easy to, to say, yeah, I was, I was in the flesh. I did bad things. I thought bad things. You know, I did terrible things. But, but I, I, what I, the word the Lord is asking to share with the church today is, do we understand that we still have a problem? I always say, well, I'm better than I was before. Hallelujah. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm on the way. But we have to recognize, first of all, that we also have a problem. I say that because I've met so many Christian people that, have, that would say things like, oh, I've been serving the Lord for 10 years or 20 years or whatever. 
I, I got it all together. I don't need to go to Bible study anymore. I got it all together. And I'm saying, you know what? You're in a dangerous position. When you think you have it all together and you don't need this, you don't need the body of Christ, you don't need the fellowship, you don't need the, the preaching of the word of God, you don't need to worship God, you don't need to get a little messy over the things of God, then I think you're on the verge of, of just turning away from God altogether. So first of all, I, I think if we want to be Bartimaeus-like, we have to understand that we do have a problem, and the problem is our sin nature. And... Uh, Here's some references for you. First John 1 John 1.9, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we're lying and we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Case in point, in the early church, there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember the story that all the early church was selling their possessions and bringing their money to the, to the apostles to, for the benefit of the church? And they sold their possessions and they bought some, brought some money to the church. And <clears throat> Peter confronts them and says, you know, you, you lied to the Lord and you lied to me. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And first it was the husband that was struck down dead by the Lord. And then later it was the wife that was struck down. All to say, you know what, there's, there's stuff going on in the church that's not right. If they could only have admitted, I've got a problem. I've got pride or I've got, I've got needs that I need to get, have met. But, but they weren't able to do that. Later on, we hear the story of, of Peter and, uh, and uh, Barnabas that were uh, fellowshipping with the Gentile believers, the Gentiles who became Christians. They were fellowshipping with them, eating with them. And then when the big shots from Jerusalem came up to visit, the Jewish Christians who were the leaders of the church came up to visit, Peter and Barnabas refused to eat with those lower class Gentile believers because they were afraid what the others were going to think about them. In the church, in the camp, there's this prejudice, there's these feelings of, you know what, superiority or inferiority in the church. And I, the Lord is saying, we've got to get to a place where we understand, I've got a problem. We've got a problem. Let me mention a few things to you, and I'm going to move on quick, quickly here. You know, some people have a problem with elderly people. But some people have a problem with young people. Some people have a problem with poor people. And other people have a problem with, guess what, rich people. Some people have a problem with, with sick people that are always, you know, chronically ill. And other people think that healthy people are, you know, have it all together and are prideful. Some people have issues with different races, different cultures of people. And I'm saying to the church, you know what? We need to be Bartimaeus-like. We're the people on the curb begging. We're still begging. We're still the person that's undone. Oh, God, I need help. I need help. I thank you for saving me, but, Lord, I need more of you. I need more of you. So if we want to be Bartimaeus-like, we've got to understand that we have a problem. Thank the Lord that we're saved. But, see, the problem should compel us to keep coming to church, keep coming to the altar, keep coming to worship God. Are you hearing me today, church? The second thing is this. I see it in verses 38 and 39. If we want to be Bartimaeus-like, if you notice in this story, he's all alone. No one's there with him to help him. In fact, uh, the people that are there uh, are telling him to get away from Jesus. Don't go near Jesus. But the second point is this. Bartimaeus saw Jesus on his own initiative. He heard Jesus was walking by, immediately began to cry out to him. Now, I, I have, you know my stories. I have my stories about my friend Lenny. I have my, my early pastors in my life, different men in my life. God used them to, to help me. And I'm all for fellowship. You know that, right? I'm all for camaraderie and, and, and all this good stuff. I'm all for that. But what I'm saying is I've seen it I've seen it too many times not to say anything about it. We could do all we can do, and we do all we can do. We'll make the phone call. We'll make the visits. You know, we'll give people rides, and we'll bless people with this and with that. But at some point, every one of us has to get to a place where we will seek God on our own terms, just me and God. I want people around me to help me, but you know what? Ultimately, it's me and God. 
And I, I want to just stress that Bartimaeus was one that didn't wait for the whole, all the people to come and, and to, to get him there. This is one story where he was all by himself seeking God. Can anyone relate to that? I, I've had, I, I think I've probably told you my stories of, I, I remember sometimes I would still probably do it in, in the years ahead. Just walking the streets at night with a stick in my hand, hitting the pavement, hitting the telephone pole. Lord, you got to speak to me. You got to talk to me. I need to know what to do in this situation. Just all, by, all alone seeking God. All alone. I, I can remember uh, back in my young, younger day, my early 20s, before I was a Christian, seeking God. And and the only way I knew how, you know how I did it? I think I shared this at some point, but I went to a place near where I grew up. It was a big, it was actually a lake. It was called the Keyhole. It was a a large body of water. I went there as a kid to do my turtle catching and frog hunting and all that good stuff. But as a young man that that was confused, I went back to that place and I laid down on the ground trying to grab the dirt in my hand, trying to make a connection with somebody or something. And I think God saw my heart because shortly after I did receive Jesus into my life. But but I'm saying there's got to come a time in your life when you may have all the people in place, all the things in order, but you on your own will have to run after God. There may not be anybody there to help you. John 21 is a great case in point. You know the story. Peter had denied the Lord three times. I don't know the man. I don't know him. And the rooster crowed, remember? Later on, he wept bitter tears. He was crying. John 21 is his restoration to Jesus. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes. Three times. And then Jesus prophesies over Peter. And says, you know, you, you will die in a certain way. Crucifixion upside down is what he said. And Peter's response, you know what he said? What about John? <laughs> he didn't even get, what, what, like, I would have said, I'm going to die like that. No, what about John? And Jesus says, paraphrase, you know what, Peter? It's none of your business. I'll deal with John. You follow me. And the Lord is saying to us, you follow the Lord. You follow me. You find your way. Find your path. And if you have people around you, praise the Lord. We should have people around us. But ultimately, there will come a day when we've got to do things on our own. So if you want to be Bartimaeus-like, we we will seek God individually. The third thing I see is this, verses 40 and 42 through 42. Bartimaeus sees the moment. He sees the moment. I don't know if you've ever met somebody famous. Have, has anyone ever met somebody famous? All right. Now, I, I have some, st- I, I met, a, I, I didn't meet, but I, I was at a post office once, and Tom Seaver was in there. Tom Seaver's a great pitcher. Major League Baseball. He, I, I totally froze. I thought I would have said, hey, Tom Seaver. I totally, there's Tom Seaver, you know. And, and uh, I, there's another story in our lives. Pamela and I have a, have a little history. We were in, uh, in Greenwich Village in New York City one time. And we're walking down, and it was, it was at night. And uh, this guy bumped into me. He, he kind of tripped, and he kind of fell into me. And I helped him, you know, reestablish himself and, and get on his way. <laughs> and Pamela was behind me. And I, I, I keep walking. I didn't think anything of it. She, she and a friend of hers are starstruck. Because the guy was a, was a famous, famous British actor. I had no clue. His name was Alan Rickman. He was in the movie Sense and Sensibilities. I don't know if you know that movie. Pamela loves the movie and loves this actor. And, and for the first time in my wife's life, she was speechless. <laughs> oh, She was all the way home. She couldn't talk. She couldn't talk. I said, Pam, what's the matter? It was Alan Rickman. I said, who's Alan Rickman? And she was speechless. And she wanted, I should have said this. I should have done that. I should have. And she was, she couldn't say anything. All that to say, when Jesus came by and Bartimaeus was there, he did not freeze. 
He sees the moment. And this is the thing. When Jesus is passing by, church, we need to grab on to him with all that we have. He saw the Lord pass by. He sees the moment. Jesus said, what do you want from me? He said, I want to be well. I want to see. He didn't hold back. He just let out his request before the Lord. And he seized the moment. In church, we must also seize the moment. Isaiah 55, 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And God is near. I just broke my eyeglasses. Look at that. Uh, God is near to us. Do you know there's good things happening, lo and behold, in New England there are things happening today, today in New England. You know, this, we're getting ready for this Boston night of worship. I shared it last year. I saw the video clips. These things don't happen in New England normally. They happen in Atlanta or Texas somewhere, maybe another country. But you have thousands and thousands of young people worshiping God of all races, all colors, all, all denominations, worshiping God in a public place. And I, I think it's so exciting that God is moving in New England. We have uh, this thing, National Day of Prayer, coming up first uh, Thursday in May. We'll be talking more about it. But I'm excited that churches are getting together right here in Haverhill to do a, to do a, a, a corporate prayer gathering just at, for the body of Christ. God is moving in New England. Not to mention, may I be frank with you? God is moving in our church, church. You know, it's amazing when, when you hear, you know, the feedback of people. Someone will say, oh, God is so strong in our church. God is moving in our church. And another person will say, we need more of God in our church. Same service, same body of believers, same situation. One person is close and one person is far. I'm telling you, God is moving in our church. If you notice our worship times, not that you could characterize it by, by how long, but you can characterize it by how intense. There are some intense worship times here. Sunday morning, both services, Sunday night, Wednesday night. There are times of worship when I know we're breaking through to God. And in that setting, that's when we need to cry out to God and seize the moment. He's walking by. Jesus is walking by. Bartimaeus seized the moment. Church, I'm, I'm telling you, you must seize the moment. There's a scripture in Amos. It says that, to paraphrase, because I can't read my notes anymore. <laughs> to paraphrase, it says in Amos, I think it's 8.12, there will come a day when you, people will run to and fro seeking for a word from God, and they won't hear it. They won't find it. The moment will pass. Kevin, I'm going to call you Kevin Mercy Simone. Thank you. I hope these work, brother. Oh, they do. Very good. Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord. Amos 8, 12. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of God, but they shall not find it. As opposed to the opposite of that is, read Romans 1 sometimes. Sometime. People that have, a, that have an understanding of God, but they don't worship God. They don't run to God. You know what God, God does? He lets them go. And they go from bad to worse. God is a gentleman. He won't force anybody. But I'm saying when he's walking by church, we've got to seize that moment and run after him. The last thing I, I would say in this passage, Luke 18, is in verse 43. If we want to be like Bartimaeus, not only do we need to admit that we have a problem, and uh, not only do we have to seek God alone, and not only do we have to seize the moment, we have to become what we would call Christ followers. Because Bartimaeus, the whole story concludes by saying he was healed physically. He could see. But then he began to follow Jesus and glorify God. I've heard stories of people that were touched by the Lord, even healed by the Lord, and never really surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. But when, we're, when we are touched by God, we must then give our life over to him and surrender to his Lordship. I, I would put it this way that Bartimaeus became a Christ follower. And I wonder if he, would, if he became, you know, I always think about what happened to him. Did he become one of the 70 that the Lord sent out? Was he in the upper room as one of the 120 waiting to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I don't know what happened to him. All I know is that he became a Christ follower. And if we want to be Bartimaeus-like, we will become Christ 
followers as well. What do I mean by that? What I mean is our hearts need to, need to be hungry for God, always. We don't need to wait for a crisis before we hit our knees and pray to God. We just pray to God because that's what we do. We worship God because that's what we do. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I had shared a message. Maybe it was last week. Well, I think it was last Sunday. Uh, one of the things was to, to read the Word of God and hear the Word of God. Someone told me afterwards that they had a friend that for 10 years, as part of their daily discipline in prayer time, they read a particular psalm every single morning for 10 years. And that was their way to begin their day. They re, and they had it memorized after a while, but they would recite that psalm every day for 10 years. And that was the beginning of their prayer time on that particular day. So I've been, I've been trying to find a psalm that I like a lot that I'm going to read for the next 10 years or something like that. You know, it's not a bad discipline. But why would I do that? Because I'm in trouble or because I need God in some special way? Not really. I just need to get closer to the Lord. I want that to be a part of my routine, part of my life. So we need to become Christ followers. And uh, I'm going to have to stop right there. So there's four points <laughs> to think about. Are you a Bartimaeus? Do you understand that we all have a problem? Number two is, do you seek God individually? Number three is, are you seizing the moment? Number four is, are you becoming a Christ follower? So every head bowed for just a moment as we pray.